you're the 1996 Nobel Prize winner in physics for uh, um, superfluidity, and um, I'd like you to just quickly uh, tell the story about uh, that discovery and um, what it entailed and um, what it meant to you at the time, I guess, before you knew what, what it would mean to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should correct you if I, if you, the, 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 the prize was actually given to three people. Okay. Uh, uh, I was a graduate student on that experiment, and then David Lee and Bob Richardson were the professors in the group, uh, and certainly uh, both of them were important. So you know, it was it was we the, a shared uh, joy. I You're the lucky uh, graduate student uh, out there uh, taking the measurements, right? Well, you know, I would like to. I think uh, first of all, I built most of the apparatus. Uh, it, it, it was a new technology, helium-3, helium-4 dilution refrigerators, and then another technology beyond that. So I was, I think I was pretty, pretty involved in this thing. But I worked late hours. I think the, the, the entry into the lab book the night that I realized what it was that I discovered was at 2.40 in the morning. And, you know, I ran around the, the basement of the physics uh, building eventually even went up to the sixth floor where the theorists hang out that share this exciting news. I was the only person in the physics building that night. Oh, wow. So eventually I, I just, you know, I couldn't stand it anymore. I called up my thesis advisor at four in the morning. <laughs> you have to be sure you're correct if you're going to do that. I think I've heard a story like this before with crystallography, crystallography or something like that mm -hmm. where someone was making the experiment and running around like crazy or you know finding mm -hmm. the the interesting aha moment and then not being able to find anyone for mm -hmm. a length of time that was unbearable yeah. it but it is su it's such an amazing feeling to to know something that's going to be considered important now there whether superfluid helium 3 is actually worth anything i mean it it, it isn't a technology that that mankind uh, is is going to use for any particular purpose other than to understand, but but superfluid helium three is is very a direct. Uh, it's a neutral analog of superconductivity, uh, which had never been seen before. Well, so I, I'd seen that there was some evidence for a phase transition inside this cell, which was buried deep in the cryostat, and and uh, I I. I think what happened is I used nuclear magnetic resonance to look. I mean, it was either a transition in liquid helium-3 or in solid helium-3, and, and it was that night that, that I realized, in fact, that the magnetic susceptibility of liquid helium-3 dropped by over a factor of two exactly where I saw this phase transition in terms of the, the melting pressure. And so, you know, I, I, it, was, it was just a matter of figuring out what was going on. So what's the difference between, uh, it can become a fluid before it becomes a superfluid, right? Or is it, or is it yeah. fluidic state superfluid? No, 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 you're, you're certainly right mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're different. Uh, a fluid is, is you know, one where you have viscosity, uh, the atoms are, can move around, they're not s stuck at lattice uh, a superfluid is one where there is a coherent quantum mechanical wave function. I, your your v viewers may not like those words, but, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, helium-4 becomes a superfluid, actually, at a very high temperature, of high temperature being two degrees above absolute zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, two degrees Kelvin above mm -hmm. absolute zero. And, and uh, but, that was understood a long time ago. So people had predicted that, that helium-3 might become a superfluid, and a lot of people had looked for it and hadn't found it. And then here I was, it was right in the palm of my hand, figuratively speaking, because right. it was inside the cryostat. And what happens is all the helium-3 atoms, or some large fraction of them, have condensed into this macroscopically ordered state, which is controlled by quantum mechanics. And, and so the, the, the atoms are all doing the same dance, so to speak. I can't remember one of my, <laughs> I think, collaborators used that term. Anyway. <laughs> and and uh, it, like I say, it had been predicted. And in fact, it was kind of interesting because the, there was a guy named 
Phil Anderson, who's I think turning 90 very soon, a uh, remarkable guy who, who had predicted uh, well, that, that helium-3 would become a superfluid and that it would be a specific state called the Anderson, well it's now called the anderson Morell state, they didn't name it after mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, and, and then there was another state th that had been predicted, it was the Bally and Wertheimer state. And it turns out in he liquid he superfluid helium-3 that as you cool down, uh, depending upon what pressure you're at, you first go into the, the anderson morell state, and then there's a phase transition to this other state, the, the, the Bally and Wertheimer state. So, you know, basically I had discovered everything that had been <laughs> predicted. Oh, very nice. Those theorists must have just uh, been, can I buy you lunch? You know? I think uh. they were happy. <laughs> yeah, we were all happy at that time. The Bose-Einstein, well, first of all, Bose particles and Fermi particles are very different. So in Fermi particles, no two can occupy the same quantum state. So th they, they, they do order at very low temperatures. So helium-4 becomes a superfluid at, at 2.17 Kelvin. Helium-3 becomes a superfluid a factor of a thousand lower in temperature. Wow. So it's, and that's because of the fact that you've got to get, I mean, it's uh, in helium-4, all of the atoms drop into the same quantum state. In helium-3, it's, it's much more complicated than that. I think, uh, the, the advances in science are made usually because of curiosity. I mean, people are interested in what's going to happen if if they put matter or some other whatever in into a particular environment uh, and and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. and, and so, freak, and not uncommon that 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 you will. Uh, want be measuring something, but because that measurement happens to be in the temperature, pressure, whatever range mm -hmm. where this transition occurs, you know that 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 uh, you will discover something that's very different from what you were looking for. I mean, an example is is Hakey Camerlionis uh, and Dewar were were. Uh, in competition to see who could first liquefy the lightest and most inert of the atmospheric gases. And, and it, it looked like uh, uh, Dewar had won when he succeeded in liquefying hydrogen, which is the lightest gas mm -hmm. for sure, but it's certainly not very inert. Uh, and, and, and then he, he uh, was able to pump on the vapor above the liquid and solidify it. So <laughs> there was only one, one uh, element left and that was helium and so so Camerlionis decided he so he was able to to liquefy helium but when he pumped on the vapor above the liquid no matter how hard he pumped it never solidified and in fact liquid helium stays in a fluid state under its own vapor pressure essentially to absolute mm -hmm. zero so that was you know one thing that was learned from from uh, Camerlionis's uh, Cam experiments but there's something else too so he, he, of course, because he was rather disappointed that he couldn't solidify helium. Mm. And so he decided that he would do some other experiment or answer a question that people had been asking. And so the, the, the question was, what happens, would happen to the electrical conductivity of a very pure metal if you could cool it all the way to absolute zero? And there were two schools of thought on this. One was that as you cool it at some low temperature, the conduction electrons, which were free to roam around the interior of the metal, would recondense on the ions from which they'd come, and all the electrical conductivity would cease. Mm -hmm. And the other, well, anyway, so, so Cameron Leonis tries this experiment. He, he, he's luckily, he's working, uh, luck certainly plays a role in, 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 in discovery. He, he chose a metal which became a superconductor. So he had a very pure sample of mercury, and, and when they cooled it down uh, at about 4.2 Kelvin, uh, the electrical resistance of the mercury dropped essentially to zero. And that was the discovery of super. I don't know what time of the day or night that, that happened, but uh, Cameron Leonis had a, an associate, I mean, he was a graduate student or a postdoc named Jill Holst. He was the one that actually made the measurement and he just didn't know what to make of the, this 
I think Cameron Jonas felt that a lead had to have fallen off of the sample mm -hmm. in order for the e electrical, uh, uh, well, the for 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 the signal anyway for for the the uh, the signature that they saw w would have suggested that the the conductivity was infinite that resistance was zero you know you know I'm not the only one <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to expect but I said well let's take a dielectric material like a plastic or something like that and, and measure its dielectric constant as a function of temperature I mean it's a very simple thing these are you know these are not you know <laughs> you don't have to be a deep theorist to, to decide to do something like that. And so what, you know, you have to take good data though. And what I found was uh, that the, the dielectric co constant varied logarithmically with temperature. And I thought, wow, everything goes to some power law of the temperature. How do we go logarithmically with wow. the temperature? Anyway, of course, there, there were, you know, theorists that had, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, you know, predicted that, that, that that should have happened, and it did. I, I would usually actually work, you know, my, when I was a graduate student, this, this later I was, I was, when I got the, the call from, from Stockholm, I was here, and it's, uh, you know, I was a professor at Stanford already, but, but uh, the, uh, I, I would usually work, you know, wh when I was a graduate student, uh, uh, I would, uh, come in. My wife and I would come in at noon. She was a biochemist, mm -hmm. and and we we would uh, uh, work until uh, six p.m. Then we'd have dinner on campus, and then we'd work until midnight. And at that point, I would drive her home. I would come back in the lab wow. and usually work until you know three or four in the morning somewhere. So those were great hours. No one bothers you at that time. And it's actually it's it's better than that. I mean, there's less e vibration in the building, there's less electromagnetic interference. So it was really a good thing to do all around. <laughs> so all experiments should be done at three o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just for um, fidelity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so when I th when I realized that I discovered superfluid helium three, I ran around the, the 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 physics building. I was quite literally the only person in the building, so not everyone subscribed to my work <laughs> ethic. <laughs> what about the the call uh, yeah, the call so, you got? So so uh, I guess I was you know busy and I hadn't even noticed that they'd started giving out the Nobel prizes. Physics isn't the first prize, and and so you know I. Th I think the call was, it was 2.30 in the morning. I remember because, in fact, I, it's recorded, well, it was, it was recorded on the phone's answering machine, so somewhere I still have that. But, but the, the, the phone rings and I, and I say, hello? And this guy says, hello, hello, is this Douglas Osharoff? I said, it's 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> and the, the voice on the other end says, I know that. I have a matter with certain glee in his voice. I have a matter of some importance, if you would. I am Karl Ulf Jakobsen, Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And at that point, of course, I knew exactly what this phone call was all about. And, uh, and, and I, th I really had, I think I, I knew fairly accurately at that point that my life was changing at that moment and it would probably never be the same. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, that's maybe a little bit too dramatic, <laughs> but, but it, 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 it certainly changed my life for, for quite a while. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, for instance, I was on the board that investigated the Columbia shuttle accident. And, and the reason I was on the board was that, that the, the, the people, that Richard Feynman, who's a very famous physicist, much more famous than I am, uh, had been on the board that, that investigated the, the uh, uh, Challenger accident. And so they said, well, we need Hal Gaiman, who was mm -hmm. uh, a recently retired four-star admiral, really neat guy, I really, really like working under him. Uh, uh, how how Gaiman played 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 the that that particular role. You, there are all sorts of roles you have to hmm. have in, in in this business. But so he was he was the the head of the the board basically, 
And anyway, so he invited me to be a member of it. And at what I told my wife that, that, that I'd been invited to, to be on this thing, she said, don't you do that, don't you? I mean, you know, I was very busy. We're all busy, but how can you turn down something like that? So what happens is the, the external tank, for, I mean, the, 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 cl the shuttle is an amazing uh, delivery vehicle. So there are these two solid rocket boosters. These things are 12 feet in diameter, filled with, wow. with I mean, they were Roman candles, but <laughs> of a very large sort. And uh, the, the, there was, uh, the, it was made of metal, and there were rubber O-rings that, that, that joined the pieces together. One of those O-rings leaked. I mean, rubber at high temperatures, it doesn't make any sense. But that leaked, and, and, and a, sh a, a jet of hot gas burned through the tank that contained the liquid hydrogen. So um, there, this tank was, I think, 27 feet in diameter. It's just mm -hmm. an enormous thing made out of a, a lithium aluminum alloy that was light and strong. And the technology was phenomenal, but, but the, the human foibles were regrettable for sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so so I you know the the being being a member of that that board was was really a fantastic thing. What happened? The, there was a very small leak, but you know the inside of this tank has got you know very hot hydrogen gas, and so you get a little leak going through there. You melt the rubber O-ring, mm -hmm. and then then you get a big jet of hot gas, and it was blowing against this liquid hydrogen tank. Right. Yeah. Disaster. A little bit about what happened with um, the Columbia, which you were directly involved in. The leading edge of the, of the wings of, of, of all of the orbiters were, were what they call reinforced carbon-carbon. I mean, it's a, you know, graphite, essentially. It's, it's a very high temperature material. I mean, it, 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 it glows, you know, hotter than red hot uh, and, and it doesn't melt or anything like that. So it, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful material to have. But, but uh, it's, it's, it's fairly fragile. I mean graphite or whatever it is, reinforced carbon carbon was not very strong material. So when a piece of this foam, the foam but it's amazing, it's very low density material. I, I can't, I have some uh, on my desk in my office right now, I can't remember, but it's maybe one tenth the density of water or something, very low density. But a piece that was, you know, like I, I would guess it, it was bigger than a cubic foot, so maybe a couple of cubic feet, fell off. And because it had a large cross section and it was a low density, it was accelerated. I mean, you can think about the orbiters sitting there in space and all of the, the atmosphere blowing past it, okay? So, so the atmosphere then accelerates this thing up to a very high velocity and it slams into this reinforced carbon-carbon. So even though it was very low density, it, it caused a, a big hole. I mean, you know, the, and you know, so you start letting, letting very hot gases in and the, those gases would, the, so the leading edge of the left wing is this reinforced carbon-carbon. Just behind that is, is an aluminum wall. Aluminum is a nice material, but it, 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 it melts at relatively yeah. low temperature. So, so then, you, you, then, you know, everything just falls apart at that point. But it was, it was kind of, it was, I don't know, it, it was bittersweet. It was so, it was exciting being a member of the board and everything like that, and then realizing that this accident should never have happened. And thank God we've never had another one after this. But it's, it's, sad, it's tragic that it took two mistakes uh, for NASA to learn. Mm -hmm. Was there a previous circumstance where foam had hit and they had gotten in okay? Well, so, so yeah, there had been pieces of foam, yeah, th so they had not had any big pieces of foam uh, that, that, that fractured the, the reinforced carbon-carbon, but there were pieces that had, had uh, struck uh, uh, the, uh, 
was one of the solid rocket boosters down near where there was a uh, uh, a control box it controlled the, the rocket nozzle, and uh, uh, luckily that that didn't cause a loss of life. Mm -hmm. But you know it was a lesson that NASA should have learned, and and it took loss of life for them to learn it, which is pretty sad. Yeah, but hopefully maybe there's even been some engineering. I mean, we don't use the shuttle anymore. We don't use the shuttle anymore. <laughs> yeah. Our past uh, notable scientists or people who have developed that endeavor, um, would you look up to and, and why? Oh, well, certainly uh, Feynman is one of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there are just a lot of, I mean, so if you go back and, and uh, for instance, looking at Camerleonis, you know, who basically discovered superconductivity, there, there's, you know, there are a lot of scientists that I consider my heroes. Most of them <laughs> are are experimentalists, I suppose. But but the ones that uh, that I rely on are not experimentalists; they're theorists. Guys like Phil Anderson and and you know, uh, you know, people that have come up with all the quantum mechanics and all of that stuff. Uh, so, you know, I would I would say that that that. Physics or almost any science is 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 done by you know a, a collection of people that interact with one another and you know, they share their ideas and things like that and and, and that's that's how progress and so I give a talk called how advances in science are made mm -hmm. so th there's combination of of this interaction between d different people and serendipity guys like. Camerleonis is an example. Mm. Uh, Dewar is another example. There, there were a lot of people that d d you know that, that created the basis for, mm -hmm. for the, you know the understanding of how materials behave and how in all of that stuff. In you know, as a graduate student at Cornell, I sort of inherited all that stuff, so it made it a lot easier for me. I think it was it was my father who actually stimulated my interest in science when I was very young. And, uh, you know, but my father is a medical doctor. Not, I mean, he, he, does that, he doesn't know that much science, didn't know that much science. But, mm -hmm. but he got me, you know, doing things. Well, I, I will admit I'm, I'm lucky to have survived my childhood, but <laughs> you know, a lot of gunpowder and all sorts of things were, were, were fair game back in the, <laughs> Those days. I, I think that we've gone beyond that, though. Not anymore. Uh, I almost lost an eye. When, uh, it was uh, calcium carbide. I shouldn't tell. The kids are going to listen to this. They're going to uh -oh. learn how They'll to give generate the full this. recipe. <laughs> yeah, so I won't say. So, but you can generate acetylene gas. And, and so then you, you uh, can, under pressure, you push it through a, a, a glass tube that's been, been drawn down to a, a very fine point. And you get incredibly brilliant, bright white flame, and and that's basically how miners' lamps worked. I don't know if they still use <laughs> that now. Probably not. But but uh, and so I was I was making one of these things, and uh, the, the the God I don't, again I I don't know if I want to don't tell, tell that, you, okay. but something happened right. So right. something. So what happens is, is there was there was still some oxygen inside the container where, where I generated the acetylene. And, and when I lit this thing, it went kablooey. And, and luckily, I realized that there was something wrong when I, I lit, the, I, rather than getting a brilliant white flame, I got a blue one. And that said that this thing is getting too much oxygen. And so I, I instinctively turned my head, and this thing went kablooey, and there was little shards of glass sticking in, in the side of my face and so my father was a doctor I, I I then drove myself down to his office and he sort of picked out the the, the glass and it gave me a, a lesson in safety <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't stop, stop he didn't say stop doing science no yeah, no so. no I, I think he knew by that time that it, was, <laughs> it was hopeless <laughs> what do you think about current theory on you know trying to find a universal oh, theory. Yeah. I think it's going to be hard sledding, frankly. It's, that's my guess. There are, there are a lot of these, these, these sort of what I call 
I suspect are half-baked theories at this point uh, that are floating around. And, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, I think that, that you have to start somewhere and, and, and you, you have, to, you, you get something that's credible and then, then you look at, at the equations and, and, and see where this goes. And, uh, that, I'm not a theorist, okay, <laughs> so, so I, I can't tell you very much about that, but, but you know, uh, I, s some of these theories that are coming out, I think, are, are a bit far-fetched. Mm -hmm. I would love to be proven wrong, though.